if real-time strategy ever makes a comeback, it won't, but you know, hypothetically, the new flagship game might look similar to this. Not this. The Cossack series has a strange history. It all began back in 1998, when a bunch of Ukrainians played way more Warcraft 2 than it was healthy and decided to make a strategy game of their own. The game was called Warcraft 2000 Nuclear Epidemic. It cracks me up every time I remember it exists. Warcraft 2000 was an unofficial, unlicensed and unfinished recreation of Warcraft 2 by GSC Game World, a game development company from Kyiv. For the sake of comparison, this is Warcraft 2. And this is Warcraft 2000. What you are looking at is not a mod. The project runs on a custom in-house engine, which was somewhat advanced for the time. The two games look almost identical, but the technology powering them is very different. The story of Warcraft 2000 is about Azeroth being invaded by space aliens. By aliens I mean, like, the Greys, not Burning Legion. Remember, Warcraft lore wasn't really a thing back then. The Russian language narrator mistakenly refers to the planet as Earth. The invaders make deals with orcs and humans, selling advanced weapons to both sides, hoping that they will destroy one another, leaving the planet for the greys to occupy. Warcraft 2000 had only one or two levels. The developers obviously couldn't legally sell a game made using Blizzard's visual assets. The project had to be abandoned. I love this fake box art. In 1999, the company put Warcraft 2000 into free access. The game was sold illegally in flea markets all across Eurasia. I remember my friend from school having a bootleg CD. GSC never got a single hrivna out of it. So was it all a waste of development time? No, it was not. One unique feature of Warcraft 2000 was the absence of a realistic unit cap. The game supported armies nearly unlimited in size. In original Warcraft 2 you can only select up to 9 units per control group, but the Ukrainian project had no such limitation. This technology was later used in Cossacks, European Wars, the first commercial game GSC ever made. Being an RTS with a historical theme, Cossax was similar to a more popular Age of Empires, but with a focus on 17th and 19th century European nations. The most important difference was the scale of the fighting. On some screenshots it almost looks like a total war game. These armies are fucking huge. And the unit control wasn't based on squads or anything like that. Each soldier is a distinct entity. Each one of them can be selected and individually controlled. Cossax was made in the late 90s, but the scale of the combat puts Supreme Commander to shame. I never got the chance to play the series when I was a kid. That's why I was interested in trying out Cossax 3, a 2016 version of the game. The reviews were mixed. There were quite a few complaints about the buggy launch and the fact that the game was essentially a remake of the first Cossax, but with pretty graphics and very little extra content. That didn't bother me. The bugs have long since been fixed, most of them. And look at these graphics! The game looks like a playable painting. The reason I missed out on Cossax is because I was a StarCraft kid. When StarCraft 2 was released in 2010, many of us nerds were hoping that this is going to be a breakthrough, that RTSs are coming back. This was all based on a tragic misunderstanding of the human condition. Unfortunately, most gamers don't really like classic RTSs, but for a while StarCraft 2 was going strong. I loved watching the pros play. I even used to pay a monthly subscription fee for a Korean StarCraft broadcasting service. You had to use their media player to watch the matches. It was actually quite dreadful. I remember reading on Reddit that, as an experiment, a couple of American bars were showing StarCraft Pro matches instead of conventional sports. Fuck yes! Finally our nerd stuff is conquering the human realm! 
the moment of truth came when I was watching NASL, I think, some sort of a big dick American StarCraft 2 championship. I managed to convince a friend to watch the stream with me. He wasn't a StarCraft nerd, but he played RTS games pretty much all his life. He didn't understand what was happening on the screen, so I made an honest effort to explain. The golden yellow dudes are an advanced alien race, one of the sides of the conflict. They can produce early game robot walker units called stalkers. Stalkers have an ability to instantly teleport to a nearby location on a cooldown. It's called Blink. This is useful for maneuvering around the map and for getting out of danger. So in Protoss vs Protoss matches it was important to master this Stalker micro. To teleport your units away as they are taking too much damage, both the number of surviving Stalkers as well as their hit points and shield values can be thought of as a resource. So by microing your walker robots correctly, you can make Make these beneficial trades. What the fuck am I doing with my life? The realization hit me in mid sentence. If a significance of a basic engagement is this hard to explain to a person who grew up playing real time strategy games since he was nine, explaining all this to a normie is just a waste of time. Both the gameplay concepts and the visual language of StarCraft are impenetrable for an outsider. StarCraft is not becoming the new football. Football or soccer doesn't need to be explained. There is a ball, color-coded dudes are kicking the ball, and if the ball reaches the goal, then the team scores. The mechanics of the match are obvious at a glance, but StarCraft is for a nerd's nerd. We got lucky in Korea, but it will never take over the world. RTSs are not coming back, at least not like this. I think everyone already knew that just a little slow in the head. This is all very sad and pathetic. But then, in November 2019, Microsoft released the remake of Age of Empires 2. It became surprisingly popular. 50,000 players on Steam. Not bad for a 20-year-old game and a dead genre. You know what? Maybe we were just looking in the wrong place. Maybe the problem is the theme. Could it really be this simple? A historical theme seems to make a strategy game intrinsically more accessible. It's not about collecting blue crystals and mining alien gas. Instead, it's about fishing, chopping wood, mining iron. You know, things people do in real life. You don't need to build air-conditioned supply boxes to extend your unit cap. Instead, you build houses, homes. It makes sense. People live in houses. The more houses you have, the more people you can support. Being heavily influenced by the Age of Empires, Cossacks works pretty much exactly like this. In order to obtain better arms and armor, you build a blacksmith. In order to research technology, you construct an academy. Horses are trained in a stable. Ships are built in a shipyard. This guy has a gun, means he works at range. This dude has a pike, he is good against horses, but only in melee. Cannons are defenseless up close, but they deal massive damage at long distances. Horses move faster than people. This guy over here is riding a horse, but he is armed with a rifle. Means he is both fast and he deals damage at range. We're moving to advanced concepts. Everything works exactly like you expect it to. StarCraft is for nerds. But Cossacks is for everyone. Age of Empires, Men of War, Cossacks, strategy games with a historical theme don't require detailed explanations of arcane gameplay concepts in order for you to understand what's happening on the screen. If the genre is to make a comeback, its new flagship game will probably be historical. And it doesn't even have to be ancient, medieval or early modern history either. You can make a game about the Cold War proxy battles, or even about the still ongoing military conflicts although the latter seems like it might be in a poor taste. 
Cossax is not a very complex game. Nothing here is as scary as it looks. After you collect enough resources, you can upgrade to the next century. The mechanic is very similar to AoE or Anno series, except in Cossax there are only two centuries, 17th and 18th, early game and late game. If anything, the mechanics are a little too simple. Nearly every major European nation of the period is represented in-game as a playable side, but most of them function in a very similar way. Almost all nations have pikes, musketeers, low-tier horsemen, high-tier horsemen, cannons. Some countries have slightly better musketeers, slightly faster mounted riders and cheaper artillery. For example, Russians have the best early game spears and good late game muskets, but their workers are very slow to build. Ukrainians have great early game musketeers, but they are weaker in the late game. I guess this is supposed to reflect historical strengths and weaknesses. Funny, Cossacks still has Warcraft genes. Like, the game menu is opened not by pressing the escape key, it actually does nothing, but by hitting F10, like in Warcraft 2. Another important difference from Blizzard games is the unit balance, which is very rock-paper-scissors-like. In StarCraft there are no hard counters. Some units are very good against other kinds of units, but typically with creativity and micro, you can make a unit work even in situations it's not designed to succeed in. In Cossacks, however, ranged units are completely hopeless in melee, as in they deal no damage at all. Horses seem to be hard countered by pikes. Artillery units are automatically captured if they lose their human escorts. Everything is hyper-specialized. I'm not sure if I like this or not. And the game doesn't have a story in a conventional sense. There are quite a few campaigns. Each individual map tells about a certain historical challenge. For example, in the first Ukrainian mission, we are tasked with rebuilding the Cossack homeland that suffered a Tatar raid. You have to build a town, travel to a faraway port city to ransom captives from the Tatars who don't even start as hostile. You make deals with another friendly Ukrainian faction, the Cossack troublemakers will attempt to provoke an early conflict with the Tatars. You can follow along or you can choose to ignore them. Serfs from Poland will flee to the Sitch and you can accept them or send them away. The serfs are very valuable because you can't build workers in that mission, but do you really want to piss off the Poles? A Sitch is a Ukrainian term for a fortified military center of the Zaporozhian Cossacks, a proto-state that existed between the 16th and 18th centuries in what is now central Ukraine. Historically, Ukrainians were stuck between several worlds, the Catholic West, the Orthodox Eurasia, and the Muslims to the south. The conflict with the Tatars is inevitable, so the first level ends in a massive mess of a battle with hundreds of men dying on each side. The Crimean Tatars are represented by Turkish units. Another playable Muslim faction is Algiers, which is rather unique. What other RTS allows you to play as Algiers, or as Zaporozhian Sich for that matter? Look at that, the Russian cathedral building looks like St. Basil's. While the individual nations in Cossacks do not possess the same degree of mechanical identity as, for example, the StarCraft factions, in terms of aesthetics, everything is very high effort. Visually, all buildings and units look very different from culture to culture, even though in terms of function they are quite similar. Surprisingly, the game is very easy to micro, and in general it seems to be friendly to lower APMs. Unlike in Total War, flanking doesn't seem to do much, so it's all about building a lot of dudes, organizing them into formations and attack moving to success. A single map in Cossacks supports up to 32,000 units. If you are familiar with the RTS genre, you might be thinking, well, the pathfinding must be a nightmare. That's not really a problem because units in Cossacks can clip through one another, like StarCraft Mutalisks. 
but you don't necessarily want to do this in battle because the game has area of effect weapons. Units clipping is something that is probably required for making Cossex function as a game, but it sure looks strange with otherwise realistic visual style it has. You see this thing? This is a river ferry that can transport up to 120 units. Unloading all of them at the same time makes it resemble a clown car. That sure looks dumb. But ultimately these are small things. Who cares about a little jank? Although it does beg the question, what does the increased scale of combat actually do for the gameplay? It makes the units more annoying to control, but does it actually open new tactical possibilities? Are there more decisions to make, more ways to outplay your opponent? The game has formations, but establishing efficient firing arcs was important in StarCraft 2 and in 1. And in any game that has ranged units, I'm afraid the answer is no. The relaxed unit limit doesn't make the tactical gameplay any deeper, but it looks cool and maybe that's enough. Maybe. However, the lack of any kind of audible unit feedback is just straight up a design flaw. There are no unit confirmation sounds in Cossacks. No affirmative, no zug zug, no entaro adun. The units just silently obey their orders. Now, I can understand why the developers didn't want to record unit lines for two dozen different playable ethnicities, but where the hell are the advisor sounds? You know, new construction options? We must construct additional pylons? that kind of thing. There have been several instances where I failed to notice that I've been invaded by a huge fuck-off Tatar horde, because the game tells you this via a tiny text box in the left corner of the screen, which is very easy to miss when you are busy managing other shit. Additional supply depots required. In many RTSs, the advisor becomes an important character. Like Cabal, Eva, or the guy from the Majesty series. Cossacks 3 is a modern reimagining of the first game. It's been 20 years. This flaw should have been identified and fixed. And the game is still buggy. In the first Russian level, Tatars would park a bunch of riders on top of my serfs and do nothing? They're supposed to be hostile, but they're not attacking. They're not even targetable. This fake invasion happened to me three times. They're just standing there staring at us like they've never seen a Slav before. Look, uh, a limb. You have to shit or get off the pot. The developer, GSC Game World, lived through some turbulent times. The entire country did. After the original Cossacks became a commercial success, they went on to make Stalker, A Shadow of Chernobyl, an FPS RPG Slavjank classic. Then the studio went through some internal drama and was closed by the owner, only to be reopened again a couple of years later. Their first game after reopening was Cossacks 3. Their second game will be Stalker 2. This is some cyclical bullshit. In a funny coincidence, some elements of World of Warcraft lore over the years evolved to resemble Warcraft 2000. There is a powerful alien race called Naru, capable of space flight. The Horde destroys a human port settlement by dropping a mana bomb from a goblin zeppelin. Clearly the Ukrainians understood the soul of Warcraft. Azeroth is Ukrainian clay. Sorry, StarCraft, but it wasn't meant to be. It's not you, it's me, but it's also you. Here is a funny esoteric anecdote about GSC. Between Warcraft 2000 and COSX-1, the Ukrainians were working on another strategy title. This one was even less commercially viable than their illegal Warcraft sequel. I present you... Doomcraft a real-time strategy game with hell demons and doom marines as units. And these are not plagiarized doom sprites. These are custom meshes, and they look good too. Really good for early 3D, actually. The game existed as a prototype. They were working on it for five months before switching to Cossacks. If you Google Doomcraft, you will find almost no information on this project. A little forgotten piece of RTS history. So, is COSX 3 a good game?
Mm, yeah, yes it is. If you like Age of Empires, then it's an easy recommendation. Decent way to pass the time waiting for AoE 4.